Hi, welcome to the Electric Revolution Skills Hub podcast. My name is Dean, and in this episode, we'll be speaking to an amazing explorer, Alex Hibbert. He talks about his adventures in minus 44 degree conditions, how climate change is affecting the regions, and his up and coming challenge. It's fun, it's scary, and you won't want to miss it. Hi, Alex, how are you? Hello, I'm very good, thanks. It's a a busy day, but it's nice to be here to talk to you. What are you up to today? Um, Well, I've actually just finished organising all of our freight, which is about to head up to northern Alaska. Um, It's a great deal easier, believe me, than having sort of four or five bags turning up to the airport. And so everything is obviously um, organised, listed, and then then shrink-wrapped, ready to head up uh, to the the far north. And then... um, Later on today, I'll be heading to the Midlands to give a to give a speech. So it's going to be a, a fairly full on day for me. But it's uh, it's nice in the final days before heading on an expedition to have different things to uh, to focus your mind on. Um, I gave you a short introduction at the start. Obviously, do you want to sort of expand on that for people that don't uh, don't know of you? Just just to let guys know, the YouTube channel that Alex has got is absolutely amazing and quite frightening in places. Absolutely, the the YouTube channel actually. Before I do the quick in- intro, was was a slight accident after. Um, after lockdown, because I had lots and lots of footage of um, uh, obviously the expeditions that I do, but also this expedition lifeboat that I've been working on on a project that COVID then put pay to. And I thought it would be amusing to put some uh, some sort of basic edits up on YouTube. And then all of a sudden it took off. So that's now become another string to all the things I have to do uh, uh, work wise. Um, yes, my, my background. Um, so I studied biology um, back when I was an undergraduate and I was always interested in doing things in, in the outside, uh, in, in, in the outdoors, um, but also to have a cerebral um, element to everything that I do. And I had this idea that I wanted to go to the Arctic and I thought maybe it would just be once, maybe um, that would be it and I would get it out of my system. But once I completed my first big expedition called the Long Haul, which was organized most, mostly whilst I was at university, um, and then I went and uh, completed with a friend of mine, I then realized that I, I simply had to do this for a living. I, I, I had to upscale absolutely everything from the expeditions all the way through to um, uh, equipment and clothing and communications, every, everything that I wanted to try and sort of push forward and innovate. So I created a career around that. And of course, most people will probably um, guess that if you're creating a career out of expeditions, out of journeys, just trying to get from one place to another while staying alive and hopefully staying friends with your teammates, um, then you then need things that branch off from that. And I found the yeah. best ways of communicating with people um, is through speaking and writing. Um, but also I'm moving more towards broadcast. And also I like to do a lot of things behind the scenes too. Um, helping, as I just mentioned, developing equipment and clothing and, and, and gadgetry, I suppose you could say, uh, in order to try and push things a little bit further forward. Because there's a bit of a history of quote unquote explorers uh, looking back a bit, doing sort of re- reenactment expeditions uh, and uh, pretending to be from a past time. But of course, we're not. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to be a modern adventurer who just did everything the easy way. And so I've specialized in what's known as unsupported polar travel, which is basically doing the physical work yourself and being self-sufficient without resupplies along the way. Um, and I've also become a bit of a winter specialist. And I, I, I suppose you, you would imagine that, of course, you would be traveling in winter. It's the Arctic. It's, you need snow. And that's right. But normally people travel in the sensible time of year, which is sort of spring, spring, summer. And certainly the Antarctic season is, is almost always a summer season. Um, I decided that winter would be sort of that extra notch of challenge. Um, yeah. Because, of course, when you go to the, to the higher latitudes, uh, you don't get a great deal of sunlight. And in fact, sometimes for months on end, you get no sunlight whatsoever. So I've become a sort of a winter specialist and unsupported specialist. And I've tried to have a career that spans a a number of different areas to keep me interested, really. What's the difference between the summer and winter in those climbs? Uh, It depends where you are. So if you're on on land during the summertime, uh, it's highly likely there won't be any snow cover. And so it can be rocky and dusty and there can be some um, sort of uh, low low shrubs and, and, and vegetation. And so traveling across that is extremely difficult. You could hike, I suppose. Um, but also if you have lakes and and, uh, and, and sort of marshy areas, there are uh, flies become an enormous problem. So for me, uh, I find that summer travel doesn't have a great deal to recommend it. Those who are into kayaking, I'm sure, will uh, will feel differently because there are some amazing Arctic rivers 
which people can either pack raft or kayak or, or, or so on. Um, when you're talking about sea ice um, in the in the summertime, there will still be some sea ice in, in many areas, but of course it's fraction and it moves, it moves around a great deal and you can have uh, milk pools on top of it. You can get foggy conditions. So the, the, the summer is really a very different beast um, to, uh, to the spring or the, or the winter time. Up high on ice caps, uh, you might not be able to visually tell the difference between the winter and the summer, but the way that the surface behaves and the way that the weather um, performs, that will be the thing that will make the difference. And you might think, well, if you're going to cross an ice cap, why not do it in summer? Because you have lots of sunlight. Um, surely, that's the, surely that sounds much better. But of course, if you end up with temperatures which, say, on the Greenland ice sheet and some of the lower elevations are around zero, around sort of the, the thaw temperature, you can get such slushy snow conditions that it's a nightmare to travel. So it's not always obvious that traveling in a more benign time of year is going to be better for you. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as the temperatures drop and the light dims for, for the winter, and I'm talking about both the Arctic and the Antarctic, of course, at the, at the different times of year, uh, the, the ice and the snow will then thicken, consolidate, and in my opinion, give you a much better traveling surface but then, of course, you might have to deal with worse weather uh, and, of course, much lower temperatures. Mm. How, how do you think the temperatures have changed? Have you, I mean, Greenland is somewhere where you've been back a few times, isn't it, if I'm, if I'm correct? Yeah, I've, I've been to Greenland over, over a dozen times. And the thing about, um, the thing about expeditions um, in my sort of, uh, let's say I'm going to be traveling on the ice for a few decades, uh, mm. the difference that I'm going to see on expeditions uh, from what might be a cumulative two, three, four degree overall change in uh, in, in air temperature, uh, I'm probably not going to notice. What I notice most as a as a traveller is, in fact, um, the different weather conditions that the wider global impacts of what what's happening and the change that's happening, uh, what those impacts um, lead to, and that can mean storms. It can mean uh, what, and more storms earlier in the season. It can also mean that the sea ice behaves very differently. So although I'm not going to be noticing a degree or two, what I do notice is the um, uh, the unpredictability. Now, the Arctic has always been an unpredictable place to travel. You yeah. know that a storm can appear in, in, in a split second, um, but it's the ferocity and it's the uh, unusual times of year that these now seem to be rolling through that can take you unawares and you need to be um, aware of. I think that the... Changes in Greenland are going to be more noticeable for the people who who live there year round because, of course, I can pick my times to travel. And in fact, even if I was to say, right, the the late spring, for instance, is now no longer good for travel because the melt, the thaw, comes a little bit earlier than it did ten years ago. Uh, I'm just going to shift everything forward a bit, so I'll, I wasn't be really? set off two weeks earlier or three weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. So I can actually mm -hmm. adjust for that. The problem comes for those who live there permanently and they can't be as picky as, as I can about, um, about travel times. So what's that going to be like? In, you just said that change over the last 10 years. What's that going to be like over the next 50 years? Well, I don't think anyone really knows. I mean, you, you can look at the trends, you can look at the graphs and we can, ex of course, extrapolate where that's going to go next. Now, of course, things can slow, things can accelerate. Uh, most people, I, I suppose, will assume that if this graph is, is going off in a certain trajectory, that that's likely to continue unless something dramatic changes in um, in the uh, in the planet's um, uh, behavior and in our behavior, I suppose um, as well. Our behavior, yeah. Uh, in fifty years' time, um, I, I, I suspect in fifty years' time it might be uh, towards the end of my career, uh, and I expect that the possibilities for expeditions will be uh, completely and utterly un unrecognizable compared to what we can manage now. And even in the last 10 years, I've, I've only been going just over a decade. Uh, what I have noticed is that certain logistical options, so places where we used to be able to be dropped off for expeditions 10 years ago, and even just sort of when I was looking at getting into expeditions and was still seeing it as more of a theory uh, in my future, uh, and I was looking at other people's expeditions, I was um, looking at uh, possibilities for being dropped off, for instance, off, off, the, Russian, uh, off the Russian coast, uh, for North Pole expeditions. Now, that has been completely impossible for, for years now. And uh, even in the final days, uh, in the final few years, when the Russians were offering logistics, um, this, is, this is a private Russian company that used to offer helicopter drop-offs for North Pole expedition teams. 
the last communication I had off the boss was um, there is as uh, there is enough ice off the cape, off the bit of land where we would set off from, uh, maybe for a cocktail. There is not enough ice for you to ski on. Um, whereas just a few oh. years later, they were setting off two or three teams a year onto good quality sea ice, and yeah. they were able to travel north from there. Um, so yes, the the change is is substantial even within the period of time that I've been working. Uh, and in Greenland, I, I, I tend to come back to Greenland a lot because it's where I've traveled most, even though I don't want to be typecast as a as just a Greenland guy. Yeah. Um, but the, the routes that I was doing uh, in 2007, 2008, uh, which isn't that long ago, that was right back in my early 20s when I was getting started, uh, those routes are now impossible um, because, first of all, the government now won't give you a permit to travel early because they got um, they got uh, worried about people basically getting too cold, which I didn't really fully understand. I, I believe that you should travel in, in the colder part of the season uh, because then uh, the snow and the ice tend to be in better condition. And frankly, you should be able to deal with, with cold temperatures if you're there. And that pushed people later into the season. And then the melt is sort of coming at you from the other end, at the other end of the season. And now the melt, the melt season is now constraining traveling so much that you simply couldn't do the routes that I was managing um, back then, including a, a nearly four month expedition, which obviously needs to have a very, very long window of, tra of travel time. In order to fit that mm. in, that was a 113-day expedition. Yeah, in the intro, I talked about the IPCC that was able to prove in 2021 that there's a direct link between human activities and climate change, um, and just you know a, gra a gradual increase of warming and supplies around the planet. But it's it's causing problems with the infrastructure of the planet in terms of storms, um, you know, seasons being more unpredictable than ever before, and even in Europe, we've seen that. And what people don't realise is that it, it really, I don't think it can be reversed. I don't know if you think that's the case. We, we can slow the issue, we can slow the warming, or we can neutralise it. There's got to be a lot of work for the world, really, whether it's consumers or whether it's certainly businesses, in things like electrification, um, moving more to more a mass, really, of clean and renewable energies as well. Do you, do you sort of believe that's going to help the slide at all? Well, my area of interest is, is, is of course, the Arctic. Um, and the Arctic is being disproportionately hit by changes in um, uh, changes in weather uh, and changes in, in temperature o over time. It appears that the um, temperature uh, increases are, are higher there than the, the global average. And that can become a bit of a self-perpetuating system because the more, let's, let's talk about sea ice uh, on top of the oceans, the more sea ice that melts, uh, the more water, of course, you have in between um, the chunks of ice. And that water is dark. Uh, the ice is, is light in colour. And that it has a distinct effect on how the sunlight, which is then beating down on it, is absorbed. So in the past, the ice would, of course, reflect lots of light and therefore heat um, and would actually reflect that back up into the atmosphere again and, and, and hopefully away to, to, to somewhere else. Now, now that you have a great deal more ocean exposed to uh, the sunlight, that is heating up faster and faster because that dark water, that dark surface, is absorbing more um, more light energy. So the Arctic does seem to be disproportionately affected. Now, in terms of what's causing what and whether things can be reversed or not, there are obviously a thousand question marks, and I, I'm I'm slightly reticent um, to join the ranks of certain activists who decide who have decided that they that they know the answer to that and everything is either going to be an absolute disaster or on the flip side um, it's all absolute nonsense there are um, there's a little bit too much certainty um, from some uh, from, from, from some camps um, but I think that there's um, little con uh, controversy to say that there are probably two things at play here first of all the planet uh, is not a static environment. The planet over millions and millions of years has been doing strange things. It's been going up and down in temperature. There are um, obviously our, our entire world changes shape um, through uh, across tens of millions of years. All sorts of things have happened outside of our control. Uh, but it's fairly clear that we have been, um, let's say, soiling our nest. We have not been behaving well. Now, a lot of that happened uh, a, uh, long, long before we realized that it was a bad idea. So perhaps pe um, people who were trying to improve uh, human existence back during the Industrial Revolution can be forgiven. Um, I don't believe that they were evil, selfish uh, 
uh, people. What they were trying to do was develop humanity. Now, mm. we're in a situation where it's quite clear now that what we have done is contributed to accelerated and maybe um, uh, diverted uh, the state of the world that would um, that would have been the case if we were not here. And so we, mm. we, we, we need to make some changes. Can we reverse what's been done? Who knows? Do we want to reverse what's been done? Possibly. Uh, do we want to slow what's going on so we can actually get a real handle on on how big the problem is? I think I, I think yes. Um, I think that allowing something to almost uh, run away like a like an out of control locomotive is is by definition going to be a bad idea. Um, but there are so many other reasons why it's a good idea to stop burning things and cutting things down and reducing habitat for um, for, for wildlife. There are so many reasons, completely aside from our global temperature as to why that's a really bad idea. So I think most people can get on board with the idea that it's a good a good plan for us to look at our actions, uh, look at our behavior and decide a better way forward. So I've watched pretty much all your videos on your channel. And if uh, anybody watching this, please, I'll drop the link down below um, of Alex's it. channel. <laughs> it's, it's incredible, incredible. And I've watched one uh, recently with you in doing a test expedition in Canada. Um, where you're using single skin tents in minus 40. I mean, it was, it said minus 45, but it actually, re I, I believe it reached the bottom of the thermometer where it didn't go anymore. Um, how many, how many layers do you wear in that sort of thing? And how, how on earth do you deal with the cold? I mean, I've put my blue lights on in the background to try and represent cold, but I've got the heating on, so that doesn't really count. How, how many layers, how do you even survive that long? Yes, yeah, so, so do I. I. I certainly have the heating on here. People, people often assume that because of what I do for a living, that I absolutely adore being cold. Now, actually, the skill of being a, a, a being an Arctic traveller, a cold weather traveller, is that you become rather good at becoming as comfortable as you possibly can. And that was exactly what we were trying to do in that tent at minus. I, I think it was minus forty four. I couldn't quite claim yeah, forty five yeah, on, yeah. uh, on that yeah. particular night. Although last winter, when I was up in Alaska. My teammate and I did get minus forty-seven, so that's now my my sort of my my personal record for travel. At each sort of um, uh, threshold of temperature, so let's say minus twenty, minus thirty, minus forty, minus minus fifty, um, people think oh, that just sounds incredibly cold, and it's diff it's difficult to understand how they um, how they affect the way that you have to behave and how um, and, and how things perform. At minus twenty, if you're well dressed and you're exercising, it really is quite comfortable. Um, mm. assuming that there's, there's not a, a howling wind. And um, I've got footage of me skiing along at minus 20, minus 25 with an open, uh, with, 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 an, with an open jacket, chatting to my camera and, ha and having a nice day. At minus 30, you need to really switch on and, and pay attention to, to your extremities and also look after your equipment that, that little bit more because mm. certainly plastics start to become slightly more uh, fragile in, in low temperatures. Once you hit minus 40, uh, your priority more or less shifts from mileage, because normally what you're trying to do is cover as many miles as you possibly can during the day, uh, assuming you're not doing a science survey, assuming you're doing an exploratory journey. Uh, and it starts to shift more through to self-care uh, and right. care, of course, for your, for your teammates. It's about not making any mistakes. And when you get towards about minus 45, yet, I mean, even camping, which is supposed to be the, the comfortable, uh, pleasant time of the day, you have to just really pay attention to, to everything. In a single skin tent, it's not going to make a massive amount of difference because you don't have the sun shining down and giving you a nice sort of greenhouse effect. And really, you're not going to expect a, a, an incredibly thin layer of nylon, whether it's one or two um, uh, layers thick, to really hold a great deal of heat in. And besides, we don't heat the tent. Uh, you're supposed to be very strict with the stove so that it's it's only doing something specific like drying out something that's accidentally got damp or melting mm. snow to make hot water and if you saw a couple of clips uh in that in that uh, in that video on youtube where the, the burners were just running um that was that, that was a bit naughty we shouldn't have been doing that you're, you're supposed to shut those off uh, straight after the um, the stoves were actually doing something so the temperature inside the tent is not a great deal different to what it is outside and mm. you've just got to wear the right gear. Now, when you're actually traveling, you don't wear that much gear at all. And people are often surprised as to how little I do have on. Uh, if you are hoarding a big, heavy sledge behind you, a sledge that can weigh 150 up to 200 kilos, that's a lot of work going on. And so as long mm. as those calories are going in, you'll keep yourself warm wearing a merino wool base layer and then essentially a, 
maybe a, a soft shell windproof. You don't want any any uh, any waterproof clothing because you're not going to get rained on. What you want is breathable clothing to let any moisture from within to get out because you don't want to get damp. Damp is the absolute killer. So when you're exercising, you don't want to wear that much, even at minus 45. It's when you stop, then you're putting the tent up, camping, maybe doing some science work, commu uh, communicating, using the satellite phone. That's when you do layer up. And so I then have insulated trousers and, a, and an insulated jacket um, to keep me warm when I'm when I'm there. Now, the, the traditional clothing for keeping warm has more or less uh, for, well, s since the advent of, uh, of sort of baffled clothing has been, has been goosed down. And uh, there are issues around whether that's a, uh, an ethical idea or not. And of, of course, there have been big strides in, um, in making sure that down uh, goose down clothing or, or duck down clothing um, comes from good sources. Uh, but it's only really useful in the spring or the summer. And I often love when people are walking around when it's raining outside in, in, in down jackets because they just turn into a damp papier mache. It only works when they're dry. And if you get any yeah. dampness into what's in, into the, into it whatsoever, you'll end up with blocks of ice forming inside the goose down. Oh, so actually yeah, these course. days, because I do travel in the dark a lot, I tend to use a uh, goose down equivalent, like a, like, like a synthetic insulation. And that works a lot better when it's, when you, when you can't leave it out in the sun to, to dry out. So you've got to keep your, I suppose, your extremities warm. I, I saw a, I saw a clip of you with the two burners on and your feet, both sides of the burners. Is is it important that when it gets to a certain level? That was a luxury, of, yeah. Yeah, I see, yeah, that's yeah, probably naughty, naughty there. But if you get to a certain level of cold, where it, when it goes past, what, what at what point does it get become cold into frostbite? Um, well, frostbite is a complicated thing because I think most people just assume frostbite means when your fingers go black and fall off. And that's obviously the most extreme form of, of frostbite. So you can get cold damage to your to, to, to your body, whether it's to your, to your, your nose, cheeks, they're, they're quite um, uh, they're quite susceptible. Earlobes, if you actually accidentally let an earlobe uh, uh, sort of um, just sit below the level of your, your beanie hat or whatever um, head protection you're wearing, that can quite easily get bitten. And then obviously toes and fingers. And you can get a bit of a shot across the bowels sometimes and get a bit, bit of a warning if you do make a mistake. And I, I've had that a few times whereby I've just pushed it a little bit too far. I've allowed a finger or a toe get a little bit colder than I should have before doing something active to sort that problem out. And then you'll, you'll, you'll generally lose sensation. Um, they'll turn white. Uh, but that's, that's completely recoverable. That just means that the blood flow is having trouble getting into that extremity. And you've then got to actively rewarm it. And down below minus 40, you should be for almost more than you're, you should be thinking about navigating. You should be thinking about, how's my big toe? Yep, that big toe is good. That, that, how's that big toe? Constantly wiggling them around to, to reconfirm to yourself that they're still alive. Um, <laughs> and the same thing for your fingers and for your thumbs. And so if you let that go too far, if you're just a little bit blasé and you think, oh, it'll be fine. Okay, it, okay. It, it, all I need to do is yeah. ski a little bit faster. That'll come back to, come back to life again. Um, then you can get a problem. If you don't actively right. re rewarm a, a, an extremity that is um, that that is getting cold, and then beyond the the, the blood flow um, pulling back from that extremity, which is what the body does to try and uh, look, look after itself, it's a bit of a counterintuitive behaviour that it that it that it, um, uh, that it undertakes. Uh, if that tissue actually freezes, if the skin and then the, the, the flesh beneath beneath it actually freezes, those cells will of course die, and then that's going to be the fr the first stage of, of frostbite. And even that, to a certain extent, that can just simply turn into a minor wound and the body can actually uh, recover. The, the nerves can recover. And that's a very painful process as the nerves essentially wake up again days or weeks later. Um, and you get this horrible stinging sensation. But if you again mm. ignore that happening, you can get large chunks of tissue freezing, literally freezing solid. All the water within the cells completely freeze. Um, oh. And at that point, you will then eventually have... Uh, loss of the end of a finger or, or 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 even worse and that's when things go black and fall off and of course yeah. uh, because um that that flesh then starts to essentially rot you can then get toxins and en uh, ending up in your blood and that can co cause blood poisoning and that's why something uh what you, you could say is only cosmetic perhaps like the loss of a finger that can actually kill you because of what is then released into your bloodstream wow that's amazing I bet some um, amateurs go out, don't they? And they don't really know all of this. They've not really experienced it. I think they probably struggle, don't they? 
I think so. Yes, there's um, there are two sides to this. I don't believe that because what I do for a living uh, gives me um, the sole right to go and travel in remote parts of the world. I've worked very hard over the years to get good at what I do. And I've specialized in one particular sort of travel. I, I didn't want to be like a generalist adventurer who's a bit rubbish at everything. I'd like to be as good as I can possibly get at my one sort of specialization. Um, but people who don't have much experience, yes, they are at, at greater risk of wearing the wrong clothes, behaving in the mm. wrong way. Uh, a, a very common mistake amongst amateurs or, or beginners is to simply wear too much clothing because they think, well, at the beginning of the day, it's really cold. I'll put all this on. They start moving. And then all of a sudden, they're a sweaty heap. All that sweat then turns to ice. And then all of a sudden, they're in serious trouble. A couple of fun bits. Pringles. Are you sponsored by Pringles, Alex? Because in all of your... <laughs> I am not sponsored by Pringles. with Pringles. Um, but I'm always, I'm always a firm believer in in um, in putting your money where your mouth is. So I, I would never work with a brand that I haven't spent my own money on beforehand. And so I suppose that's an yeah. invitation to whichever company owns Pringles. Um, yeah. They're they are absolutely delicious, as we all know. Um, yeah. They are strangely calorie dense. I, I know that most people know that they're not um, particularly healthy. Um, but even in terms of the density of calories that we try and get through expedition food, they're not too they're not too far off. But most usefully, once they're all gone, that tube, I mean, you don't want too many of them, but that tube is very useful for really forcing um, uh, down into the, the, down into the bottom um, wrappers, little bits of uh, little bits of rubbish. And so instead of a huge bulging rubbish bin, which you at some point need to, to, to get rid of or, or maybe incinerate one evening and then sort of compact that down, instead you can force all your little wrappers into this tube and it makes the inside of your sled a little bit neater. So it's, it's, it's also like a, a housekeeping tip as well uh, using, using Pringles cans. So Pringles brand, if you're listening, sponsorship opportunity. I, I, I'm not generally expecting an entire wholesale change of the population to start using Pringles cans as, as rubbish bins, but any, anyhow, it's a, <laughs> it's a, a secondary use. Students do, students do. Um, toilet breaks, how are they handled? I mean, it's freezing cold. How, as a man in particular, do you... Yeah, to, uh, to, toilet breaks are handled extremely rapidly. And um, you, 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 you tend to get a, a sort of a technique down. Everyone has their own way of doing things, um, of, of course. Um the, the most obvious uh, technique for the more straightforward um, uh, toileting requirement, let's say, is just turn your back to the wind and get on with it. Now, when you want to do something a, bit, a little bit more elaborate, uh, you do need more of a technique because that is actually a, a time when you are quite vulnerable. Uh, you, could, you could get cold fingers because uh, I won't go into too much detail, but of course you need no. a little bit of dexterity. Uh, yeah. and um, you are not at that point going to be fully clothed. So you need to look after yourself. And I mean, if, if there's an absolute storm raging, then you do need to take your shovel out, build like a little protective wall um, out in the snow that can protect you from the wind, and then you can uh, do what you need to do. But, but, but generally, uh, all, you, all you need to do is, um, is uh, get yourself into a, into a little bit of shelter um, and crack on. Actually, actually, one tip that I, that I will share um, is that you, we don't tend to take – toilet roll from the outside of the roll we take it uh, we tend to take it from the center because from the center as you pull it comes out obviously in one uh, in, in one sort of neat um uh in, in one, one uh, neat progression and then you can simply rip it off and go which means you can kind of do it one-handed and so you can stick that down uh, into the top of your jacket and so you can have one hand steadying yourself with your shovel and the other hand um doing what needs to be done um, there are other tips I probably can share, but I think they're probably be, uh, probably beyond no, the scope of that's uh, enough. podcast. <laughs> that's enough, thank you. Final thing, what's your final <laughs> things? I want to talk about your books um, uh, at the end, but uh, what, what's your latest expedition? Where are you going? And you know, what are you doing there? Mm. So Alaska, uh, I had this idea about 18 months ago um, that it would be interesting to do an expedition, particularly in one part of the Arctic that I've not been to yet. I talked earlier before about Greenland being somewhere I spent a lot of my early career and I don't want to get typecast as just being a, a Greenland specialist. And yeah. of course, Alaska is a very significant part of uh, part of the Arctic. And because COVID put pay to my last big, fully uh, big budget expedition, which was also mm -hmm. being filmed for a documentary, that was a very exciting time. But of course, uh, it was completely put pay to by, by COVID. We, we actually signed the contracts with the sponsors and everything. 
I, th- I think it was two weeks before lockdown began. So that was a pretty heartbreaking moment. But I thought, well, in the time that I need to recover from that, try and build that business back up again and try and re um, uh, to, to try and get it refunded, I need to get out onto the, the ice and do something interesting. And so I, uh, I found a, a teammate, James, and we decided that we were going to try and ski the North Slope, which is essentially the huge expanse of, of open tundra, which covers the top, let's say, the top quarter of, of Alaska, north of the Brooks Mountain Range. And in, in, a, in a lot of uh, senses, you, if, you, if you look at it, it looks a bit like an ice cap. There's almost no, uh, almost no terrain to speak of, apart from just a, a huge icy landscape covered in actually a relatively thin layer of snow. Uh, it's, it's normally only, only about a foot deep on top of the tundra. And so the plan is to ski all the way from the east to the west. And uh, if, if that's done, we, we don't believe anyone has done that in, in such a sort of a pure form. Of course, there are hundreds and thousands of, of native Alaskans. And in fact, their ancestors who went across into Canada and Greenland who will have traveled on that land. But in terms of doing an unsupported crossing from one side to the other without, uh, without stopping to, uh, to, to uh, build camps and villages and, uh, and, and, and to hunt and fish locally, we're simply trying to do a, an athletic challenge moving from one side to the other. Uh, it should be quite quite unusual and quite novel. And it's a particularly cold part of the Arctic, which is strange because if you look at Alaska on, on the map, compared to some parts of the Arctic, it's not that far north. In fact, the Arctic Circle mm. is only roughly in, in, uh, across the centre of, uh, of, of Alaska. But because you do get uh, cold air patterns where it simply sits, uh, not static, but it sort of sits on top of that large expanse of land, you do get cold air just staying put. And so that's why you get temperatures down approaching minus 50. And that's not including wind chill. That's genuine air temperature approaching wow. minus 50. But we're well, going to be hoping your record then, to have it? some temperatures in the minus 20s and 30s. Too. Yeah. That would, well, that would that break, break record, my record. I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure how keen I am to keep on breaking this record because now for <laughs> the successive years, I've now managed to break my coldest temperature record. Uh, and although it's you know it sounds very impressive, Frankly, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with, with minus 47, and uh, I'd be deeply, deeply grateful if the Arctic gave me lots of minus 30, minus 35 um, through through this winter coming up. Your books, you've got three narrative books and one photo book, and uh, they're available. I'm just going to drop a, a screen uh, over the top just to show you where the books are available from, but pretty much everywhere. Are they, um, are they, are they audio books as well, the three narrative ones? They're not. Um, I was w- w- with a small publisher, and uh, the resources that go into doing audiobooks are quite significant. And when, when my first book was uh, was published, of course, there were audiobooks, but it wasn't the huge behemoth of, of an industry that we um, that we now see. And so I, I sort of missed the boat a little bit for those uh, for those first three. But I'm absolutely sure that the next one, uh, as and when that happens, will be will, will be an audiobook form because I know that a lot of people like to absorb. Um, my offerings uh, when they're walking around or going running or on the train or something like that. And some people simply prefer to listen to, uh, uh, well, probably not prefer to listen to me, uh, whichever very talented voice voiceover artist we managed to get. Uh, maybe, maybe Stephen Fry, if he's, I think Stephen Fry does almost every, every voiceover of every book. Um, <laughs> so yes, that, that would be, that would be nice to do uh, because it just gives people another way of, of absorbing what can be obviously quite a, quite a long book. And I, I do tend to get in trouble with with editors because I like to give people value for money and I give quite substantial manuscripts in and then get told, oh, we need to lose 50,000 words. And of course, that's that's heartbreaking for an author because yeah, you feel yeah. that those 50,000 words are delivering something to the to the reader. Also, you can follow uh, Alex's channel, which I mentioned earlier, which is on YouTube, which is at Alex Hibbert Originals. Again, I'll drop the link down in the description for you. Some fantastic, he narrates all of it, um, amazing adventures. There's some incredible things you do with bits of equipment to fix things when things go wrong, um, which is just just incredible. Well, that really is, that really is the nature of traveling. Um, that, that really is the, the nature of traveling unsupported. Uh, you've really got to fix everything as you go along. And it's, uh, it's the real difference, I think, between people who have sort of experienced the cold against people who have traveled for multiple days, multiple weeks in, in the cold. Because you can be a little bit more blasé if you if, if you live in a cold part of the world and you're simply dr- and you're you're driving to work in a, in a in a heated truck you then go into a heated building 
if you are a bit careless and you break something, you can just go and replace it. Whereas there's a real impetus that when you're on an expedition or when you're somewhere remote, you've just got to look after absolutely everything. And you've got to be quite inventive sometimes to, to fix stuff. You're quite right. Do you want to shout out any of your other social media channels or anything else that you want to talk about? Yeah, well, I, I try and do um, a few different channels for different reasons. And some have worked better for me than, than, than others. I've never quite understood. I'll, I'll be honest. I've never quite understood Instagram. And so I've slightly dialed down um, the effort that I've made on it over the last few years. Uh, Twitter, I, I, I was quite an early adopter. And that's where I talk about a whole range of things, not including um, Ar- the Arctic. Although that, that, again, is on a slight hiatus at the moment as I, as I try and work out what direction that platform is going to go in as to whether I want to really invest a great deal more time in it. Uh, YouTube, as you say, I've got the Originals channel, which is mostly... Uh, my expedition videos, but also the development of Alan, the orange lifeboat that's going to be uh, front and center of my next big uh, Arctic yeah. expedition. Uh, and then I also have a smaller channel on YouTube, which I'm trying to build at the moment called Arguably, which is where I have uh, either monologues or discussions about things that I find important and perhaps slightly uh, not not uh, controversial for the sake of it, but things I think should be discussed. Uh, I've then also in the last six weeks opened a TikTok account and yes. I am still uh, yet to be yet to be convinced. We will see what happens with okay. that. Okay. Be convinced. It's a very powerful channel and the demographic is not where you think it is. Thank you, Alex. That's been absolutely outstanding interview you've given us. Um some great insights, some a lot of fun and gr- good luck in your next adventure, my friend. Thank you very much. It was really, really nice talking to you. Um and I hope people found what I had to say interesting or at least gives them some some food for thought and maybe some uh, inspiration for some further reading.